Welcome to the Voices of Experience program, Making Equity the Priority in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Dean of the Daniels College of Business and our moderator for today's panel discussion, Dr. Vivek Chowdhury. First, I wanna thank US Bank for sponsoring Voices of Experience. VOE would not be possible without their sustained support. So thank you, US Bank. Next, I also want to thank Lee Gash Maxey, Executive Director of the Colorado Black Chamber of Commerce, for partnering with us to produce this event today. Lee has been a true partner to Daniels. In addition to helping partner on this VOE event, we're also working together on a program to help Black entrepreneurs grow their businesses, and we're hoping to launch this program sometime this December. We're deeply grateful to Lee for her partnership and collaboration. And Lee, I know you're there, so if I could add just on a personal note, I really want to thank Lee for her incredible spirit and sense of humor, which makes every interaction with her a joy and a privilege. So thank you, Lee. Now, I am delighted to introduce our fantastic panel. I would like to welcome Beatrice Opoku Asare, Global Director of Inclusion and Diversity at Newmont Corp. Beatrice joined Newmont in 2010, holding several roles in human resources in both Ghana and the United States. Our current focus areas, including partnering with the board, with senior leadership, and all regions and sites to develop and implement an enterprise-wide inclusion and diversity strategy. Welcome, Beatrice. Thank you, Dean. Next, Charles S. Johnson, Senior Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Ball Corporation. His passion for diversity and community outreach, his entrepreneurial spirit, and his strategic agility have earned him consistent recognition as a performance-driven leader, helping companies, communities, and people to prosper. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Dean. And finally, Salvador Mendoza, Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for NBC Universal. Salvador is responsible for the development of short and long-term strategies in the areas of workforce, leadership development, community partnerships, and NBC Universal's employee resource groups. He has been recognized as one of Hispanic Business Magazine's 100 Most Influential Hispanics among many other prestigious awards. Welcome, Salvador. Thanks for having me, my pleasure. Well, it's delighted to have you all. And I started by reading very, very brief bios for each of you. But clearly those don't represent all of your accomplishments and all of the challenges and things that it took to get to the place that you're in now. So I would love to start with just asking each of you to share a little bit about your career and professional journey and what it took for you to get to this leadership role you're in today and in the specific space, the DEI space that you're in. So Beatrice, why don't we start with you? Absolutely, Dean. Thanks for the opportunity. Really, it's nice to be here and to be able to share my experiences. And um, I, I think the opportunity to just have the conversation about the topic is just excellent. Um, I think I have um, somewhat of a very non-traditional career path. Um, definitely, you know, not linear in terms of what I actually studied in college and what I'm doing today. Totally different. If, some, if someone told me my first year, first year in college that I would be leading inclusion and diversity, I would have like sworn that would, would never happen. Um, so my career really started in environmental science. I had a chance to switch careers into health and safety. And then I've had the chance, a third chance to switch careers into human resources, talent management, and now leading inclusion and diversity. So I feel that, you know, it just tells everybody who is on the call that, you know, you don't have to be in one box. Um, you have to take, a, you know, the unlikely um, possibilities and opportunities when, when, when they're handed to you or when you come across them. And that if somebody who, you know, started their career 
in environmental science could be doing the work that I'm doing today, then it means that you could do anything that you put your mind to. Um, I think, you know, what has also helped me is a whole bunch of sponsors, people who have um, invested their time, their own experiences. And the reason why I really enjoy being here and sharing my own experiences with others, um, people who have invested a lot of the lessons that they have learned and the mistakes that they have made so that I could avoid those mistakes. So many, many sponsors. And then lastly, many colleagues and team members who gave me difficult feedback or let me know that I was doing a good job. You know, um, people who had said, maybe if you did this better, it would work better. Um, you know, they were bold enough and caring enough to share that kind of difficult feedback with me. And um, that has definitely helped me. A typical example, a lot of people who know me know I've shared this example is, you know, when you love data, you write a lot and you, you, you write a lot of things that maybe not everybody needs. And to have received the feedback from my team that was reporting to me that Beatrice, your emails are too long. Like, really, like if you printed it, it would be two pages. Um, helped me a lot because today, sometimes when we need to provide an update to the board, you, you have to come up with just one slide for everything that has happened in the past quarter, right? So um, it's simple things like that and people really being willing to just um, give you that difficult feedback when, when you needed it. A wonderful message to say that you can pursue your passion in college and your career will evolve with your own initiative and, and your own uh, interests. Salvador, how about you? Uh, thank you, Dean. I think that similar to Beatrice, right, my, my experience is nonlinear as well, because my bachelor's degree is in computer science, for example, and albeit, right, it was at the time where basically it was like Moses writing code on a tablet, in a real tablet, kind of. Uh, computer science was not, is not what it is now, nonetheless. I deviated from that early on and started working for a non-for-profit organization, working with a grassroots organization in Little Village in Chicago, growing up in Chicago. And then uh, also uh, from there, I went on to work with uh, a couple of higher learning institutions, University of Illinois and Governor State University. So having that background and working with the multicultural programs uh, in university setting I think prepare me uh, in the non-for-profit sector, prepare me on uh, my first, I will say corporate job, working with Hyatt Hotels in leading the diversity and inclusion team there. And, and having spent uh, 15 years at Hyatt Hotels and then in hospitality and then moving on then to, um, uh, to NBC Universal in media and entertainment. So when you're looking at my journey and, and I didn't get to look back at my journey until I was with NBC Universal. I realized that at every instance for me in the context of diversity and inclusion, I was always looking to my, I, I say I learned what my passion was, my, my purpose around advocacy. And when I look back from being in college and, and advocating for an office of Hispanic programs while I was in college, to moving on to working for a non-for-profit grassroots organization, primarily helping uh, brown and black kids to get into college, and then moving on to higher education and admissions and, and working with multicultural programs, advocating for those as well, and then Hyatt and now NBC Universal. Looking back, the common thread has always been around advocacy. And, and my, my role and my purpose in life as I see it, that either I do it in the not-for-profit sector, I do it in, the, um, in hospitality, media and entertainment, or higher education, regardless of what it is, the common thread will be advocacy. And let me share on a personal note, right? I think that the foundation about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I'll share this because it will be relevant to some of the conversations that we're gonna have later to, today is on a very personal note, I am an immigrant. I, I migrated to Chicago from Honduras when I was 14 years old. And I, I left my parents over there. I came to live with my grandmother in Chicago, uh, different culture, didn't know the language, um, 
different friends, different environment, quite frankly. And I always say that that is the foundation for, for inclusion, for my passion and my purpose to be inclusive, to create equity, to advocate for individuals. And look, living in Honduras when it was 80 degree weather and on the same day I get to Chicago in February, right? It was February, keep that in mind. It was February and it is 30 degrees and snow on the ground. Talking about a culture shock, just that alone. So I'm looking forward to the conversation and I shared that with you because it's not only the professional aspect of it, but my personal life as well. Being an immigrant, I was undocumented for a couple of years. So all of that experience, I think that it has taken me where I am today at uh, NBC Universal. Thank you, Salvador, for sharing that personal note. And the theme of advocacy is one that I hope we get back to later because I think it's an important piece of this work. Uh, so let me turn to Charles. Thanks, Dane. And, and Salvador, I'll just tell you, I'm born and raised in Detroit and I would leave Chicago in February to go home. So <laughs> uh, I, I, I feel your pain there. Um, first of all, I wanna join you, uh, Dean Vivek, in uh, recognizing uh, the day. Uh, and I tip my cap to all of our veterans out there as we celebrate this day. We know uh, how and why and the role you play in uh, for us to enjoy the freedoms that we do uh, in this nation. So uh, thank you for your service if you, for those who happen to be on the, uh, on the call here. I am, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I tend to think that, uh, you know, everything about my life, uh, so much of it shaped at a young age, uh, growing up in that inner city neighborhood in Detroit uh, as a young student athlete uh, uh, was, was really formed by those experiences. And uh, coming west to the University of Colorado for, for college where I participated as a student athlete uh, at CU as well. Uh, and then getting a formal education that sort of propelled me into opportunities, entrepreneurial as well as corporate, uh, all of which played a, a significant role uh, in where I am today. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting, but I, I tend to think the informal education that I received over the course of my life best prepared me for, you know, I, I hearken to say life in general, certainly, um, life and the role that I currently sit at Ball Corporation. Um, th there is uh, so much uh, that, um, that I can't wait to really delve into and talk about uh, as it relates to diversity and inclusion. Uh, but, you know, like Salvador and like Beatrice, there are, um, you know, our, our life's experience really lends itself to the preparation for, um, for these roles. You know, it's interesting as I'm growing our diversity and inclusion function at Ball. Uh, I'm, you know, the, the, the talent acquisition professionals will lean me or lead me towards a certain uh, sort of criteria for hiring. And uh, I'm almost quick to say, no, I, I, I think I have an understanding of what, um, what might uh, produce a, an effective DNI resource or leader. And oftentimes it's not what shows up on those lists of uh, criteria. Uh, but people who have a passion based on their own experiences uh, for equity, for equality, for opportunity, uh, for common sense things like how do we solve workforce challenges uh, as we move forward? Um, how do we account for changing de demographics, both, both domestically and abroad? How do, we, how do we solve these fundamental basic business challenges through the lens of diversity and inclusion? So. Um, you know, I won't bore you with too much of my own personal uh, sort of uh, uh, journey, but I'm looking forward to engaging many of those topics and, and, and issues uh, throughout the course. Yeah, not, not boring at all, Charles, because one thing that's clear is that there are many paths to getting where the three of you are at this point, and personal passion and personal lived experience is a big part of it, whether it's as an immigrant or growing up in Detroit or uh, another country. One other piece that I want you to talk about a little bit, and Beatrice, you refer to that in particular, a continuing challenge for young black professionals might be a limited number of role models and mentors that they can turn to. Uh, how would you advise young professionals, black professionals to overcome this challenge? And how did you yourselves overcome this? And uh, so 
Charles, we'll go ahead and reverse the order this time and start with you. Awesome. You know, I, I love this question because, you know, unlike many in my generation, you know, I was, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s. And like, unlike many of my, in this gener of my generation, I am extremely bullish on millennials and generation uh, Zers. I think that uh, our future is extremely bright. Uh, and so my position as a role model, both as a father and a mentor to uh, those who are in that generation is to, is to lead, right? And I think our responsibility in large part as mentors is to provide sort of the cornerstone principles of being a decent person, uh, being responsible, all those principles, all those things that I learned as a, quite frankly, a, a, a young student athlete and a child of a mom who uh, wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I, I have the lumps to prove that she didn't play when she meant do what she said do. Um, but it, I think our role is to, is to provide that. And oftentimes the best advice that I can give us, not necessarily that generation is to get out of the way. I am so impressed. And this may be the first time that this, from a generational perspective, but this is absolutely true. I am so impressed with what motivates many of our young boys and girls, many of our young men and women uh, that, and they, they, they have values, they have a, a purpose in life that I think is relevant to uh, the times. Uh, and uh, too often I think we, we tend to try to mold what those experiences or what that looks like for them moving forward. Um, if, if you believe that the fundamental principles are, have been shared, then you allow them to grow and to take leadership positions and to challenge organizations um, in ways that perhaps my generation didn't or wouldn't. Uh, and to again, just be assured that uh, those basic principles are intact, uh, where they uh, understand the environment, respect, have a common respect for people, um, but are advocates for um, for uh, the least of these. That's a wonderful point, Charles. And one of the things that uh, I think is really well taken is that this generation is often driven by a purpose which is beyond just making making a living or uh, you know rising in the organization, which is so incredibly energizing. So, Salvador, your thoughts? So, so uh, you know, on all of this, just to add to what. Charles was saying, right, because I do believe uh, the in the context of corporate America, if we're looking at this, I always say when I, I'm coaching individuals within the company, uh, the one thing that I will add is to say situational awareness, uh, because oftentimes a lot of the conversations that we're having ar around, in particular in this moment, in this movement, it, it, it is about empowerment, and we see it a lot from the individuals, from the members, of our employee resource groups uh, and, and employees in the company at all levels in the company, either in particular our black, uh, my black colleagues uh, to that extent in raising their voices in, in being empowered. But I always say to them, uh, to that extent, situational awareness will play a big part in terms of career growth as well. We have to, and I think that Charles was talking about that in the context of understanding the environment, right? And, and, and having respect because um, I almost say in whatever context I'm talking to people is we have an open environment, open door policy in the company. And I always make the recommendation to people and say, hey, lean in, right? Reach out to executives in the company, either for having coffee, virtual coffees or chats to that extent. But in that same context, I always advise to situational awareness is key, right? Our chairman is Brian Roberts. This doesn't mean that you're now you're going to be sending an email to Brian Roberts and say, hey, Brian, how about if we do some coffee chat tomorrow, right? It's, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it, it, it has to be in the context of saying, lean in, reach out, be vulnerable, uh, and, and, and guide that empowerment right now or guide those ideas that you have from a sense of empowerment, right? And we talked a little bit about that component to it in the company, as I coach our groups, as I coach my colleagues, I always say, absolutely, man. Look, as, as a diversity and inclusion leader in the company, I said, let's raise our voices, less in the context of what we're talking right now in this moment, in this movement, 
let's make demands, right? And, and, and let me uh, paraphrase, let, let me put demands in the context of being a good thing uh, for our company right now. But at the same time, as I coach individuals and in saying, be empowered, make those demands, but at the same time, let's make sure that those demands are not being fueled by entitlement because it is, it is a fine line between being empowered and making demands that are uh, constructive and that there's no particular agenda than rather than being um, entitled or coming across as being entitled, which in the end we lose allies uh, to that extent. So I, I always say to those individuals, um, young or, or early career, I will say, or those in mid or, or even senior level executives, uh, situational awareness is key, but also is how are you reaching back to those? How are you giving back to the community internally and externally to make sure that we are setting the table for others to come? So that's great. So empowerment, not entitlement, and with situational awareness, themes that I think we will come back to later in the conversation as well. Beatrice, your thoughts on this? Such great points um, from CJ and, and Salvador. Um, I guess what I will add is that um, just a quick story. So if you know Newmont, you know we're the largest um, gold mining company in the world. And if you know that, you know that mining is not, you know, a traditional um, field where you would see everybody deciding, you know, I want to go into mining. Um, but it's a very rewarding industry. However, mining really represents, um, the, the percentage of women represented in mining is about 15 to 17%. Until four years ago, I had never met a woman who was a general manager of a mine. Like when we say general manager, this is the person responsible for P&L and everything for a mine site. I had never met a woman who was a general manager until four mm -hmm. years ago, um, you know, when especially, you know, Newman decided to, you know, focus on this. And then I began to see that yet alone, anybody who, you know, a woman who looked like me, who was a general manager, right? So the reason I'm sharing that story is that I think we have to challenge when you're different and not just different in a small way, but in a really major way such that every meeting you're at, you are the one who is different. You almost need to challenge your own assumption that um, just because I'm not seeing somebody who looks like me in a position that I want to be in, um, just because I don't see that does not mean I cannot be successful. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, your question was, you know, how have I personally tried to, you know, overcome the challenge of being the only a lot of the time? It's really that that one, I think, is the most difficult part, which is really challenging your thoughts that I know as somebody who leads inclusion and diversity that representation matters. Like when you see somebody who is like you or has similar experiences to you, who is doing great things, immediately it's, it's, a, it's an unconscious reaction. You're excited for that person and you can see yourself doing whatever that person is, is doing. But when you don't see it, we need to challenge ourselves to understand that, you know, it doesn't mean we cannot be successful and that there are many, many unlikely allies many unlikely sponsors that may not look like you, but they may have certain leadership traits. And I'm yet to meet anybody who had a leadership trait that I went to to talk to who said, I cannot share why I'm a good influencer with you, or I cannot share why, you know, um, I have credibility in the business with you. <laughs> Nobody has ever told me that they couldn't share something that I had seen them do that I thought was great. People are always willing um, to share that with us. And then lastly, what I would say is, you need to tap into your majority experiences and, and kind of see how that works. Let me give you an example. So I grew up, you know, I could totally relate to Salvador's story. I did not grow up in the US. I grew up in Ghana, but I also got to grow up in other different countries. Um, where, you know, 
people spoke different languages and where I was definitely a minority. Um, in Ghana, if you don't know where Ghana is, is in the Western part of Africa, we're all black. So being black is like normal, you know, that is the majority experience. But then if you, your parents move to a place like Libya, where, you know, you're supposed to speak Arabic and where there's not a lot of black people, nobody needs to tell you you're a minority for you to know that you're a minority, right? But I've been a majority before. So how do I tap into that experience and kind of leverage that as I engage with people who are now the majority and I'm the minority? Mm. Did I even know I was the majority when I was the majority? It was normal. You know, I just, I just flowed with, you know, whatever was going on. I didn't notice that I was the majority. And so now when I become a minority, I need to, to be able to connect to others who are now the majority and I'm the minority. How do I kind of put myself in their shoes to better understand what is going on? So what I would, you know, say to end that is that, you know, representation definitely matters, but from a personal level, when you don't have that representation, know that there are many unlikely mentors, many unlikely allies, many unlikely coaches that may not necessarily look like you, um, but could, could have a minority majority experience, which could help you connect with them and you could leverage their experiences to progress your career. You know, can I add one thing to that, Dean? Because I think it's such a great point, both points that were made there, but a condition of un being underrepresented is that it's likely that you are underrepresented. And so there aren't going to be volumes of, of, um, of examples, if you will, or reflections of who you are in the environment, right? In the arena. Um, so I think the one thing that I try and do is understand that and you know we we can't falsely set an expectation that the underrepresented should be or will be represented it, it's it's there's a disconnect there and so we start off and, and part of it for my for me personally was you know I, I was a quarterback growing up in the 70s uh, undersized quarterback it wasn't what I was supposed to be I was the only one in the meeting room all the time and, but that was, I accepted that reality so that it wasn't discouraging for me as I pursued my, uh, my, uh, my, my dreams of being a quarterback. And so I think part of that is how we condition um, the mindset of our, our uh, um, early career employees to understand that this is part of, this is why we're here. You're part of the battle so that ultimately it won't be the case. It's amazing, inspirational words. Let me uh, shift gears a little bit from the personal to the corporate, so to speak. So the term DEI, and of course there are three terms in there, we use them all the time, but I'd love to get your perspective on what do those mean to you? And in particular, how do they relate to one another? And to the topic of this particular conversation, what does it mean to make equity a priority? So, uh, so let me start with you this time. Uh, yeah, you know, I I always um, it, I always pause because you know the, there's some semantics. Oftentimes, people say we went from the '70s '80s. Everybody talked about affirmative action, equal employment opportunity, right? And then he moved into diversity, and then he moved into diversity and inclusion, and diversity and inclusion. Now we're in the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging. And I don't say that flip it in a flipping way. I mean, that's the, that's the reality and that's the fact. I've been part of diversity and inclusion uh, formal roles for over 23 years now, 15 at Hyatt and over eight at, at NBC Universals. But I always see that diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is, it is one of those things that there's a, um, there are similarities, but there's distinctions and, and there's, there's a component to it that at the end of the day, collectively, right? We know what the intent is. Is it one of those uh, issues that from a company perspective, I'm always, um, I always say absolutely less because we know just like representations matter, branding matters, right? I come from media and entertainment. So I know full well that how you market, how you brand something just that's 50% of the effort right there. So 
I will I buy into it 100%. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's there's a, there's a difference oftentimes without distinction uh, in terms of that. But if we are looking at that to say, technically, th there's a technical definition on each one of them. And what I want to do, what I do from a company perspective is to say, let's look at the intent, right? What is the bottom line in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And what is the branding message that we need to give to people without getting too bogged down into each one of those words, uh, into each one of those things? Because I can tell you, without a doubt, the tractors out there, uh, within my company, within within the community, there are detractors that will break that down and will try to detract and they will try to block because are you talking about equity or are you talking about inclusion? Are you talking about diversity or are you talking about equity? And for me is, I don't want to get too caught up on that. You know, you do that. My intent, my goal as, as a head of, as a VP of diversity and inclusion at NBC Universal is is this, right? And this is the end result. But yes, we can talk about definitions uh, and uh, all day long, but at the end of the day, it is how we act upon, it is the action planning, it is the execution, it is the engagement as we work through our communities, as we work through the companies. And for those that wanna get into the semantics as to, should we call it belonging? Should we call it diversity? I would say absolutely, let's entertain that, but let's don't get too caught up on that. Interesting, thank you. Beatrice, your thoughts? That's such a good point, Salvador. I think um, when we've done this work for a long time, we just get tired of, you know, is it DEI, is it DIE, is it IND? But I think, you know, when you when you are learning, when somebody's just getting on the journey and they come to maybe this voices of experience session and they had the terminology, then it's a good conversation starter or it's a good way for them to go back to the organization and say, oh, you know, I've been hearing this terminology or, you know, what, you know, what is DEI? What is IND? And then it's a good conversation starter. I think it's also a good way, it's a good cue um, to remind us of what is important. For instance, at NUMO, we try to say inclusion and diversity instead of diversity and inclusion because consciously, everybody just says you know, diversity and inclusion. But consciously, unconsciously, people say diversity and inclusion. But if you can consciously decide that, the culture I'm trying to create is more critical, more difficult, more intentional than just the mix that I have. So now you're using, you know, the word inclusion and diversity as a mental cue on what is critical that we're trying to create, right? At Numo, we're focusing on true culture change. And so that's the reason why we would say inclusion and diversity. So you can use it as a tool, but let me try and explain what they are. So diversity is the mix. It's either the learned or innate, um, you know, differences and similarities that we have um, for either a group of people or a team or, you know, mostly a group of people. So it's, the, it's either innate, which means you're born with it, or, you know, it's learned. Like, you know, let's say, you know, I'm an environmental scientist, but you know, I'm learning from Salvador, like I'm super passionate about marketing and branding. Um, and so if somebody sees me today and they're like, oh, you're good at that. It's not something that, you know, I, I, I was born with. I had to learn that. So that's what diversity is. And it has many, many um, dimensions. There are, pers you know, personality, organizational, community, cultural, or, you know, location, geographical, all those are dimensions of diversity they can be the same or they can be different. So it's the mix. Inclusion is what you do with the mix. So inclusion is um, the creating that sense of belonging, creating that value where the mix knows that I'm valued here and I can bring my A game to the table without spending 80% of my time trying to fit in. 
So inclusion is really respecting, valuing, and leveraging the mix. Equity is leveling the playing field such that depending on where you fit in the mix, your needs are met. Or depending on where you fit in the mix, you, you, you don't lose access to opportunity or you don't lose access to certain informal advantages just because of the mix that you have within the team or within the group. So you, to Salvador's point, these are all connected, right? Um, somebody can say equity is the how, but somebody can also say it's the product of ensuring that you have an inclusive and diverse workplace or, you know, culture. But basically, if you want to just, you know, summarize this, you can say diversity is the mix, inclusion is what you do with the mix, and equity is leveling the playing field for everybody, no matter what, where they fit in the mix. Thank you. Charles? Yeah, I, I, I would say, I agree with everything that's been said, by the way. And this is, this is one area where I'm, I'm going to ask for all y'all's prayer for me on this one. I have zero patience for the conversation, to be honest with you. And uh, the reason why is if we spend as much time zeroing in with leadership in our organizations, and, I, and, and certainly my own, um, discussing what our true objectives and desired outcomes are, then I think we, we'd all be a lot, lot better off, right? I, 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 I'm often asked, CJ, should, it, should the I become, you know, come before the D? And I'm like, sure. Well, should we be D and I? Absolutely. Should we be D, E and I? Why not, right? Let's be all those things. But he, here's the bottom line. I, wanna, I want clear objectives about what we're trying to, what, what, our, what a desired outcome is. The work is too important. I was preparing for, um, I was preparing for a presentation before a board of directors in July. And so much of my preparation was around, uh, you know, just the justification, the business justification, the return on investment for DNI, right? Diversity and inclusion. Uh, and the night before, like I often do, I called my daughter. She's 23, just recently graduated from college. And I said, one of the brightest people I know. And I, and I said, Michaela, um, uh, here's, I'm excited about this presentation I'm going to give tomorrow. I've created this whole business case. Studies are in, you can look at Harvard, you can look at McKinsey, you just go across the board. Everyone's given business cases for why DNI is relevant and why we should focus on it. So she listened, all of the arguments she heard from me probably 10 times that month already. And she said, so let me get this right, Dad. So if those studies would have come back with the, con with, with the, with the opposite conclusion, that there is no real ROI for diversity and inclusion, does that mean that women should not then expect an equal opportunity for advancement? Does that mean that African-Americans and, and Hispanic employees shouldn't consider or be considered for promotions? And it really stopped me in my tracks because I'm thinking at the end of the day, we can come up with all sorts of justifications and cute labels and names for, and Salvador, to your point, you're right, branding is, is critically important. And I would say, Understanding and being clear about what our objectives are and why we're engaging this is so important that I tend to lose patience with um, with the conversation around whether the I should come before the D. Uh, so I again, I'll finish like I started and say, pray for me, everyone. <laughs> well, Dean, Dean, may I? May I? No, may but I? Um, but uh, CJ, you're, you're spot on. I think when the conversation is between us who do the work who are trying to enable our organizations on the journey. We don't own this fully. It's not, you know, it's everybody's responsibility. But when, when the conversation is amongst us, I think that is one of the challenges because the progress is so slow that having a conversation about semantics, about, you know, what comes first is draining. But then, so that would, be, that's my personal reaction. It's draining. However, when I think about somebody who grew up in one location, has never interacted with anybody from Africa, me, has never interacted with anybody who has done 
the different jobs that I have done has never heard the terminology, then, you know, I step back and I'm like, okay, it's a good conversation starter. I will meet this person where they are at on the journey and I would indulge because they've had the terminology. They're like, why does this person say D and D and I, and this person says inclusion and diversity and what is equity and what is, you know, equality in a way and what is justice, Beatrice? I'm confused about all these. Then it's a good, from just a uh, change management perspective is a good way to begin the conversation. And in an industry like mine, where we're definitely, you know, at the beginning of the journey, you have to do that all the time. <laughs> you, 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 you just have to, um, because it's, it's not, the journey is not where you really need it to be, to be able to elevate it beyond, this is not key. Let's talk about the objectives or the strategy or where we're going to, because, it's just like me asking my five-year-old to write a thesis on inclusion and diversity. It's not going to happen. Um, but maybe we could watch a video about, you know, differences and how different people, different kids in school. Um, I think it's really about meeting people where they are at. And this is a good conversation starter. It's a good way to explain to people what we are trying to do. I would wish that we'll get to a point in our world where nobody has to make a justification, a business case for why inclusion and diversity is important at all. Because nobody makes justifications for why you need to breathe or why you need to, you know, um, eat or drink water, right? Um, and, and, and we don't treat other aspects of our business in the same way. Yeah. So I totally get your point in terms of how this can be frustrating when that job at hand is really, really um, large and, uh, and complex. Yeah. So can, oh, that can was Beatrice's can I, way of plan for me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I add something to, to that? Because uh, to your point, uh, and Beatrice, trust me, I think by now, um, I think for the most part, right, most organizations, most companies are not asking for that business case anymore. I, I think that they get it for the most part. And if you see it for the influence of diversity roles that now all of a sudden opened up right over the last four months, there have been many, many, many companies right now that they're opening diversity and inclusion departments, diversity and inclusion roles. So I will say that we're fortunate for the most part, there's still some companies that will say, give us the business case, right? I think that people get it, companies get it, what the business case is. For those of you that are thinking uh, or, or early on in your journey of diversity and inclusion, I will offer this. I think it is time, and I used to think this way, by the way, I used to say early on, I used to say, oh my God, my goal is, my dream is, that this company no longer has a diversity and inclusion role, that I work myself out of a job, that I, I used to be that person like 20 years ago, right? But over time, what, I'm, what I, I'm telling you, for those of you that are early in this field, early in career, you're thinking about it. Um, I had an epiphany again about 20 years ago, early on, that said, you know what? We need to stop saying that, right? Because I guarantee you, if indeed diversity, equity, and inclusion is a business, is a key business element of any company, any organization, any, any, any educational institution, then uh, it doesn't matter how successful you are in relation to diversity and inclusion, you're going to need somebody. And let me give you an example. It doesn't matter how successful your company is in sales revenue year over year over year, your market is fantastic, your stock options are fantastic, your stock is hitting year after year after year after year, there is no way in, in, in hell that that company is gonna say, we no longer need a head of sales in our company, right? So, or we no longer need a head of marketing in our company. So by that measure, then why would you even say, there's gonna be a point that we are no longer need a head of diversity and inclusion in our company. If indeed this is a business imperative, a business thing. Because he goes to the adage that uh, if it is everybody's job, right? It is nobody's job, quite frankly. So you need somebody there to keep pushing. Yes, pushing, to keep challenging, to keep creating, to keep 
discussing ways in which you can get more market share in our case, right? That we can put um, uh, shows and films and we can cover the news in a way that truly represents the community. So for those of you that are thinking about getting into this field, I think go from the perspective that this is a, a, a career, uh, that this is a journey that you're going to take, not with the goal to say, I'm gonna work myself out of a job, but rather is to say, how do I make this job? Truly, if the company is saying, this is a business element, this is a business imperative for my company, then you truly make it that way uh, for your company. Well, thank you, that's fascinating. You know, I'll take one lesson away from it. It's forget the terminology, do the work. Uh, perhaps it's a lesson I could take away from it. Let me also apologize to the audience in advance. This has been such a fascinating conversation. I'm about one third of the way through all of the wonderful questions that I have planned for this group. So. At some point, we're gonna to have to engage them in a follow-up conversation because uh, there's just amazing, amazing information and content. So for the purposes of today, I wanna uh, have one final question for this group and then we'll talk about the future, um, which is as you took your jobs, can you identify the one or two most critical challenges that you thought you had to overcome? And then the one or two uh, initiatives of which you are most proud that you were able to implement? And so Beatrice, let's go ahead and start with you. Um, thanks, Dean. So I think for me coming into this role, one of the things that always um, I, I, did, I did not really like is how this work can quickly become more of a window dressing type effort um, instead of truly I think it was CJ who had mentioned, you know, what are your objectives and what are you trying to solve? Instead of truly identifying and isolating what your root cause is, what your problem really is, and actually trying to solve that, prioritizing those and picking it one at a time. You know, my background from an environmental science perspective, we don't just, we never used to decide that, oh, this is, this is the tree that works best here. You know, you're going to test the soil. You're going to do all the work to make sure that if you do plant that tree, it is, you know, it's going to be successful. But I think a lot of leaders don't spend the time doing the reflection and ensuring that they really, they say we're committed to this work, then they know that we're committed to this work and they are willing to problem solve, right? So you're willing to truly if you don't have women on your team, if you don't have black people on your team, or if they're leaving, truly dissecting that and understanding that this is what our problem is and just um, addressing that problem. It may take long to do that. It may not be fancy and it may not look good from a branding perspective because you cannot just say, you know, we hired 15 women when you know that they're going to leave at the end of the day, or we hired 25 black people when you know they're going to leave at the day because you have a retention problem. It doesn't feel like something that you can sell, but that is the actual work. So at Numon, that is what we have tried to do. And that is what I'm most proud of. Of course, there are other things that I can mention, but I'm most proud of the fact that we have approached this work as how do we find the root cause of the problem and how do we really address what the problem is? And so we've really experimented with so many things. We've tested blind resumes globally. Of course, you know, blinding a resume in Peru is different from blinding a resume in Australia. So you can't just get up one day and decide you're going to blind resumes. Um, but really, the work that we have done to experiment, to pilot, to test, and to disrupt our talent systems which is any work that we're doing that is related to people, hiring, promotion, succession. We focused on hiring and we've just finished that we're about to move on to the next system um, that we want to disrupt. But that is what I would say I'm most proud of. And lastly, definitely our business resource groups. We have 22 of them um, and it's not easy, but you know they have had us have conversations that we never thought we would be having. As a mining company, we have Pride BRGs, we have Veterans BRGs, Women and Allies, we have you know, BRGs for Indigenous people and all that work that they do every day because they wanna create a better company for all of us and for generations to come. 
I would say it's definitely one of the things that I'm most proud of. Thank you, Beatrice. Charles, how about you? I would say, you know, from the, how we started and created a structure around diversity and inclusion at Ball, I think has been um, extremely um, helpful for us uh, in, in terms of making progress in the space. Uh, I think early on, Ball did three things um, in partnership with the, the creation of the function that I think are, are foundational. One, um, really engaging the board of directors and the CEO to, to make it uh, a, 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 a true business imperative for, for Ball to, to do it and to do it correctly. Two is the engagement to Beatrice's point of our workforce. Through our resource groups, uh, soon to be networks, we really uh, created an, uh, an avenue for our uh, employee base, our workforce to have a voice, uh, a voice that's going to be heard and considered. But I think the, the third and perhaps the most important of all of the three sort of foundational pillars uh, as we started off this DNI journey was the, uh, how the function reports. I thought it was critical that DNI reports directly to the CEO and not through HR, not because of personalities necessarily. One, it did establish a credibility of, amongst the, uh, the organization when DNI has that kind of visibility where it reports directly to the CEO. Uh, and um, two, it allows the function to exist, I think, in a spirit in which it's intended to exist, right? HR serves a purpose uh, in, in any organization. DNI oftentimes challenges those uh, sort of traditional purposes that HR are, are, is established to, to maintain. And if you want any real progress, in my opinion, there has to be that healthy tension. DNI has to create that healthy tension that allows the organization to see things through a broader, different lens. And it's difficult to do that if it exists within, uh, I think, a, a different function. So I think, I think those three things were foundational. It allowed us to, in just five short years, Dean, um, um, Garner in 2019, Forbes magazine as the most uh, diverse company uh, in America. Uh, and now that means different things to different people. We know our work is, there's more work ahead of us than behind us, let's put it that way. Um, but we were able to accomplish that. And now we've made the transition to say, uh, how does that show up in our workforce? You know, our, our, we've created a foundation, we've established a, a roadmap, but are we reaping the benefit of that in a truly more diverse workforce? And, and honestly, the answer has been no. Uh, and so how do we uh, become more intentional about making sure that we're broadening opportunities for uh, more people, for different people, bringing in that, um, that, uh, that, that greater thought and, and um, perspective from a broader sort of workforce, from a broader sourcing pool. So those are the things I'm most proud about, but I realize, you know, there's so much more work to be done. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Salvador, how about you? Yeah, and look, in the interest of time, right, because we, we don't have much, let me just share this is, as any company, we have blind spots that, that we continue to work on and, and challenges and, and we trip over things and look uh, as well. But I'm very proud of one particular one, mainly because this is personal. I share with you that I'm an immigrant. I was undocumented when I came to this country. One of the things that I'm very proud, and I have nothing to do with this, by the way, because I joined the company as it was in progress. But one of the things that I'm very proud of is that we were the first major network uh, in this country where we changed the narrative from saying illegal aliens to undocumented immigrants. And, and that is obviously very personal, very significant for the immigrant community, right, into how they're being portrayed. And as a news organization, as an entertainment company, that was key in terms of how we narrate, how we portray the community. So for me, it was not only a community engagement point of view, but it was very personal as well. Proud that we were the first network, major network to do that across every aspect of every platform. Now you see it, all the other net networks follow suit. Well, maybe with the exception of one and, and we know which one that is, right? That doesn't do that, I get it. 
but that is very proud because that, so I'm, I'm very proud of that element. But, but again, we still have blind spots, right? In terms of how we work for the company. Look, we are the company that has Saturday Night Live and we know that Saturday Night Live is gonna do some stuff that oftentimes is gonna put us in, in the crosshairs of people because we're not doing that, right? Our news team, we just had the Trump uh, town hall that also uh, allowed us and, and rightfully so people were complaining about it as to how we're doing that. So those are the things that we will continue to push that we continue to bring up to the forefront from a company perspective and challenge to say, we do have blind spots and we need to continue to push that. We need to continue to challenge that, that as well. Yeah. Very interesting. In the interest of time, what I'm going to do, and I hope the audience will indulge us for a few more minutes, I would love to get to a couple of the questions, at least from the audience. So, Kate, uh, if you can uh, join us and have a couple of the questions we have from the audience. Sure. Yeah. So um, because it is Veterans Day today, we did want to make sure and highlight one of our military students. So for um, for our first question and, and um, if, if there's time for another, but at least for this one question, we'd like to welcome our executive MBA student, um, retired Major Glenn Hogue. Hi, um, this is specifically to Charles. Charles, I'm graduating in a few months and as I explore organizations, I'm told that networking is the preferred path into getting hired. Uh, my question is centered around networking and one of the challenges that I'm experiencing while exploring these organizations. African-Americans seeking opportunities are faced with two options, to apply online and potentially face overwhelming odds of rejection, or to try to network into an organization where they're already very, uh, very likely underrepresented. How do you recommend minority job seekers network into these organizations that lack diversity or whose hiring practices are not inclusive? No, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And to add an additional layer on, because as you've presented the, the question, um, it, it, it's a, absolutely accurate and almost two dimensional for someone like yourself. And by the way, thank you for your service. Uh, we mentioned that at the very onset and uh, that's a heartfelt uh, thank you. Um, but you add an additional layer in your own personal circumstance where oftentimes, even when you get to the networking environment, curiosity about things that are tangential perhaps to why you're there becomes uh, the, the focus of the conversation. You know, I experienced it as an athlete. People want to talk about that game or that situation. And I'm like, no, I want a job. Uh, you know, as a veteran, oftentimes I hear from our veterans community that people are more interested uh, those who are, again, that you're uh, networking with are more interested in things that are tangential to, the, to your purpose in being there. So it's multi-layered, the challenge. Um, I, I would say there are some outstanding organizations that exist. Uh, I know in the engineering community, for example, NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers, uh, do a great job of in mass bringing their membership to networking environments. And we're beginning to see more and more um, organizations coming to those types of businesses coming to those organizations for networking opportunities. What I see happening, Glenn, is where traditionally the need for Glenn to figure out a way to get into that relevant networking environment to display his skills, there, there is becoming a balance because of the need. Part of it is the elevation of diversity and inclusion, but the need for organizations as a workforce a solution policy or from a DNI perspective, they're looking for Glenn more often now than they ever have. And so uh, I, I would say the challenge is still real, but organizations that uh, represent, whether it's vet veterans or African-Americans or Hispanics or whatever your women, um, being a part of those organizations uh, will, will help you find yourself in uh, environments where you are having a meaningful networking experience. Hey, Kate, I, I know the question went to Charles, but let me just say this, Glenn, you know, thank you for your service. Uh, quite frankly, we're indebted to you. Uh, what I will do is, and this goes for everybody, right? Because you mentioned about the networking component and, and Charles absolutely 
right on point about being able to, to connect with people. I'm going to drop my email address on the chat. And what I will encourage you to do, and by the way, look, hold me accountable to this, right? Because what I will encourage you to do is that as you look for opportunities on our website or, or anywhere else, or even you don't have to, just drop me a note. And that goes for everybody. And I know we may have like 300 people in here. It's fine. It's cool. But as you're looking at opportunities in our company is reach out to me because we have an office of military affairs in, in our company. We have talent acquisition folks that are dedicated to getting uh, our veterans jobs within the Comcast NBC Universal scope. So I'm going to drop my email. Please reach out and, and I'll connect you with some of the individuals in the company that can help you navigate all of that. Our website's there are websites that you can put in your military number and typically that translate what the job skill sets matches with some of our jobs in the company as well that can be helpful. So uh, let's connect. I'm, I'm gonna drop my email in here. So please uh, reach out. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Salvador. That's I dropped my email in there as well, Lynn and, and all. So uh, please reach out to, to Salvador's point. So for the last question, we have some really thoughtful questions in the Q&A that we won't have time to get to, too. And the panelists did offer in advance of this that maybe they would be willing to, to do some follow-up conversations. So I'll take them up on that if that's all right. And we'll address those um, off offline um, and circle back with everybody. But for our last question, we'd like to um, come Brent Troxel, one of our MBA alumni. Thanks, Kate. Uh, thanks, Dean, and all of you for being here. Um, like Kate said, I'm a recent uh, MBA alum from just graduated in June. And this question uh, was targeted to Charles, but really kind of applies to all three of you as you all have global footprints. Um, you all have either facilities or subsidiaries that are um, either internally developed or acquired. And so that's just a, kind of a, a broad range to try to figure out how you um, pursue diversity, equity, and inclusion across all those platforms, across all those locations, um, and really get people on board with that. So just wanted to kind of uh, ask what your tactics and strategies are to really um, have that, um, that purpose at the local level that kind of rolls up to what the corporate um, CEO and the board espouses that they want to accomplish. Uh, so, so I, I can take this. Uh, I'm fortunate, right, that our company has about 17 or so business units from film, entertainment, cable to digital to broadcasting. And I'm fortunate that in the company, there's, I'm part of the corporate diversity and inclusion team. But in some cases, some of the business units have their own diversity and inclusion department. So, for example, while we operate at the corporate level, the reality is that the uh, systems and the programs that are implemented in film and entertainment and cable, because the skill set that they're looking for, not only the exec creative executives, but also writers, producers, on air talent, is, is something that is the subject matter experts that he needs to, do, to have. So fortunate that some of our business units have their own diversity and inclusion teams that they have a direct uh, reporting to the, the head of those divisions, but they have a data line to us. So we collaborate on a lot of those things. So it makes it easier, obviously, and it is the same on the international side as well. I'll just add by saying that, um, especially when you sit in the US uh, and your operations are all over the world, it's very quick you quickly can become siloed and begin to think that the challenges that you have here in the US are the same challenges that somebody may have in Peru or in Suriname or you know, even in Canada where you know, it's multilingual. And so for us at NUMA, we really set our process from the grassroots and we're really talking to different leaders you know, in the different regions to make sure that we have that context um, you bring everything together and you'll be able to see what the themes are that you're hearing that are, you know, everybody's saying the same thing or, you know, there are some that are unique to different locations. And then you're going to go back and um, try to align on, on those themes that are, um, you know, that run across all the operations. And then the ones that are very unique to different locations, 
you focus on trying to achieve those. But as a global organization, you want to make sure that you're not out of touch and you're not, um, you know, thinking that everybody, you know, speaks for me. That is one of the most important things. Everybody speaks English or, you know, everybody, you know, has internet connect connectivity or, you know, because that's your norm. And, you know, you quickly would forget that, you know, somebody has to drive three hours every day to get to a, a different mindset. So it's really ensuring that you never lose touch by um, staying grounded with people who are in the various locations. And, and I'll just say briefly, but I think it's a brilliant question and implicit in it is, into my ear is corporate can't own the implementation or the effectiveness of DNI outcomes at the local, at, at the, on the ground where they really matter, right? And so um, that's part of our DNI strategy. You know, we're a multinational company with, uh, that's distributed all across the world, several offices in, in EMEA, uh, South America, over 30 locations here in North and Central America. And so you're right, DNI looks different in different places. We, what I provide and what we provide at corporate is just, so our guiding principles, these are our principles as a company. These are our broad objectives. And the businesses themselves or the regions themselves must own in partnership with the DNI function, their DNI outcomes, their DNI objectives. So they help create them. They, they by and large are responsible for executing against them. Uh, and they're measured on the effectiveness of, uh, of that. Thank you all. Okay. Appreciate those answers. We're looking for opportunities for additional conversations with our panelists. Uh, so look for information on that and uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, let me just conclude by saying what a tremendous set of ideas exchanged by this panel. So thank you, thank you, thank you. That was amazing. And we really hope that this is just the start of the conversation and not the end, obviously. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you to our audience for being here. Uh, and we'll be in touch with additional information on this and other VOE opportunities. And if we're not able to uh, connect sooner than that, have a wonderful and happy holiday season and stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thanks, um, thank for, thanks for everything. Absolute pleasure. Be safe, everyone. Have a nice, take Likewise. care, everyone. Thank you.